Let's start off here, though, in the world uh, of uh, finance and really some of the macroeconomic conditions out there. A lot of talk here about the inflationary pressures, about higher interest rates. Is this creating problems for you or is it creating opportunity? I think, I think more opportunity than problems, mm -hmm. but obviously as a credit investor, we want to protect the downside. So it starts with making sure that we've identified risk and, and address it. Uh, when we were together in October, I talked about the fact that we were in the golden age of private credit. And uh, I still feel that we're in a very good spot with private credit, but we've got a number of risks to address. You know, inflation, mm -hmm. supply chain issues, obviously, you know, global unease with uh, what's going on in Ukraine, yeah. rising energy prices, a lot to think about. But with regards to that golden age, what do you see, if at all, potentially disrupting that? What's, what's sort of the biggest risk on, on the cards here? You know, credit risk would be the, the, the biggest risk if we end up in a you know, stagflation type of mm -hmm. environment. Right. And most of the transactions that we're looking at, loan to value is very low, mm -hmm. something like 40%. So we think there's plenty of cushions should we have a, a downturn of some sort. Right. And the main thing we focus on is, is credit risk. And right now, I mean, in the here and now, I mean, we heard from the head of Fitch Ratings on a panel here at Milken a little bit earlier, who talked about the idea that we're not really seeing real distress out there, any real potential for default, at least in mass. Is that what you're seeing with regards to the companies that you're involved with? Yeah, we've got upwards of 200 por portfolio companies at any time. Uh, through quarter end, all our numbers were routinely strong. Mm -hmm. In fact, in one of our more seasoned portfolios, EBITDA year over year was up almost 50%. Mm -hmm. It's quite robust. Uh, so we haven't seen any of the, the challenges yet. Maybe a little bit in terms of hiring and, and labor cost. Maybe a little bit in some cases in service companies, uh, like medical service companies in supply chain, mm -hmm. but on the whole, very strong. Now that's through March 31st. Mm -hmm. We'll see what the next quarter brings. Yeah, I think a lot of us are, are, are looking uh, down the road here as to what that brings. Do you look at all, I guess do you lean into this environment or do you maybe try to hedge a little bit and prepare for potentially whatever the worst case scenario can be? We have a natural hedge in our private credit strategies uh, with it being floating rate mm -hmm. and, and we pay attention to how the private equity sponsors are handling rising interest rate costs. Mm -hmm. Roughly 40% of our P sponsors' portfolios are hedged now, so we, we think we can manage our, our cash flows uh, interest rate coverage very nicely mm -hmm. looking forward. And typically at Crescent, we're really selective. Now, even through last year, we had a record year of deployment, $9 billion uh, capital deployed. Still only investing in new transactions, 3.5% of okay. new things we see. So what's something new that you pursue in this environment, just broadly speaking? Uh, well, you know, a lot of what we try to do is just repeat success. So mm -hmm. we've had the benefit, which isn't really new. Right. It's, it's new back 10 years ago of incumbency. Mm -hmm. So roughly 40 to 45% of the loans that we're we're making are the companies that we're already invested in. Mm -hmm. And at some point, if there's distress or uh, some opportunity there, we would, we would move into that. But as you point out, I mean, we haven't seen that yet. Focusing more, you know, not only in private credit, but in public credit, the fact that your average bond price in the high yield bond market now is 92 cents on the dollar. That, with an average rating of double B, that gives you plenty of ways to generate yield. 7% in the public markets, over that in the private markets, mm -hmm. without taking uh, credit risk. Well, with some of the losses, though, that we've seen in the credit market, at least on a shorter term basis, to be sure, uh, over the last couple of months here, how does that change, if at all, the way you view things? We, we haven't, uh, our portfolios on the private side, and I, you yeah. know, not to talk our book here, but the average mark to market is still 99 cents on the yeah. dollar. But isn't so, there more overlap now between the private and public? Is that not the case? Well, there's a bit of a convergence yeah. uh, where even off public trading desks, you have lightly syndicated loans that are going to club members. Likewise, in, in private credit, some of the bigger unit tranche deals as they approach two and three billion dollars in size, there's four to six of us that invest in that. So there's, there's a little bit of a, of a convergence in that way. But uh, not in terms of uh, yeah. in terms of risk that we've seen. We haven't really seen yeah. any credit risk yet. I have to ask you about kind of the broader buyout market going on out there. Of course, one of the biggest buyouts that we've seen in some time, at least by an individual investor, uh, Elon Musk and his takeover of Twitter. What was your reaction when you saw that? 
<laughs> First reaction was, whoa. <laughs> that was all of our reactions. <laughs> you know, everyone yeah. uh, thought it was just a whim. Right. And now he's ready to stake $20 billion of his own yeah. money on it. I mean, it's, it's like kind of like the old swashbuckling deals that I'm sure you were used to back in the old Drexel days. But we haven't really seen that. You don't see that, at least not at the scale that uh, Musk has brought it. Yeah, no, in the old days, yeah. you know, Mike, uh, Ted, Ted Turner, uh, mm -hmm. Steve Ross. Uh, Ted Turner, you know, created you know, yeah. CNN. Mm -hmm. uh, but when he first came in, we looked at him as a visionary who really was also, you know, hunted and fished and yeah. somehow he was creating, you know, it was almost like magic, yeah. how we created value there. And and so you saw that with Elon years ago, he was doubted and yeah. now not that much to doubt. But, but now you got a lot of Elons out there, so to speak, sort of these uh, folks who've made a ton of money uh, on their primary business. Some of them are either, if they're not looking to move on, certainly looking to maybe diversify out. And I'm wondering if maybe you anticipate that we could see uh, some of these individual uh, super wealthy investors maybe look to do more of these types of deals, whether it's a passion project like a Twitter or a Washington Post for Jeff Bezos or something a little bit different like, you know, I don't know, you know building rocket ships or who knows. Yeah, actually, uh, all of those, you know, yeah. you see a lot of folks going into space exploration, yeah. not just Elon. Uh, Bezos has done a phenomenal job at the Washington Post on the digital side, uh -huh. so I don't know that it's only passion for him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, look, the, we, we, we're at the forefront of Drexel, I'm working for, for Mike, mm -hmm. of, of the media landscape changing in the, in the 1980s. I should have mentioned Rupert Murdoch and Fox News. Mm -hmm. And so this now is maybe the new age, you know, version of that with Twitter and social media. And yeah, I would expect others to follow Elon's lead here. All right, overall though, when we talk about financing deals of that size, whether it's Elon or somebody a lot less uh, famous than he is here, uh, do you think that they can still find favorable terms, relatively favorable terms, going forward in this environment? Oh, sure, I think, look, right now, the, the news report before I, I came on here was that, that Musk was looking at financing sources to skinny down his equity account. It's, it's hard to drive a rate of return at, $21 billion. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing about, you know, mega rich folks like that, they don't like to lose money. Yeah. By the way, I see that in baseball also with the owners and folks talk about it's just a passion of owning a baseball team. A lot of us look at it as a business also. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Obviously, uh, owner of the uh, Milwaukee Brewers, you guys, uh, the league as a whole, of course, coming off a big labor agreement that almost kind of looked like it was going to scuttle the season, at least for some of us baseball fans. You managed to strike a deal here. I'm wondering when you look at the terms of that, what you now have in place with the players over the next few years. You're comfortable with that? Yeah, I think what was most important is that we struck a deal. Mm -hmm. You know, arguably from the players' side, the, the pendulum had moved too far over to the where the owners were sitting mm -hmm. and didn't address some of their key concerns in terms of, you know, paying young players. A, you know, it is brutal to get to the major leagues. Yes. 750 players out of tens of thousands at play. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to earn $700,000 a year to start when they get up to that level instead of, you know, 500-something. So mm -hmm. that's important. Addressing competitive balance is important, something we're going to continue to try to address. And, and importantly for me, and I was one of the six owners on the Labor Committee, cared about changing the product on the field. We talk a lot about rules changes, mm -hmm. but I like to focus on improving the product. And I'll be cooperative with the players with the committee structure where we can make uh, adjustments on 45 days notice rather than waiting a whole season, whether it's, you know, pitch clock or a shift mm -hmm. or, or, you know, ultimately maybe automatic strike zone. It's good that we can, we can try to shorten the game and, and get more action uh, into the game. And okay. I'm very excited about that. Oh, great, Mark. We're going to have to leave it there. Really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Likewise, and thank you for having me on again. It was good to see you in October, and even better now with all these folks here.